So um, in this lecture, I'd like to talk to you about torque and angular momentum and how they're related to one another. So remember that we define our angular momentum as L is equal to R cross P, where R is the position vector that points from the um, origin or point of interest to the object, and P is the momentum of the object. All right. Now, if we take the derivative of this expression with respect to time, then we see that dl dt is equal to d dt of r cross p. So applying the derivative to each one of these things in turn, we have dr dt cross p plus r cross dp dt. So now the dr dt, that's the velocity vector v. So we end up with v cross p, right? And then the dp, dp dt, that's the force. So we end up with v cross p plus r cross f. Now the cross product of v with p is zero because v, um, p is equal to mv, so those vectors are parallel. So the angle in between them is zero and sine of zero is zero. So that v cross p term goes to zero. That just leaves us with dl dt is equal to r cross f. And this is the expression we already defined in a previous lecture for the torque. Now, we have an expression for the angular momentum of a rigid body rotating about its um, an axis within it. And that is L is equal to I omega, where I is the moment of inertia, and omega is the angular velocity. Now, remember, we defined the angular velocity as pointing along the rotation axis according to the right-hand rule, where if the object is rotating, say, counterclockwise, looking top-down, then the um, angular velocity is my sum. Okay. So an alternative way to express the torque um, would be for using this expression for the um, angular momentum of the rigid body. So if you take the derivative with respect to time of dl dt, then that would be d dt of i omega. Now, if we assume that the moment of inertia does not change in time, um, then we can write that as i times d omega dt, and the time derivative of the angular velocity is the angular acceleration. So that means that we can write torque is equal to i alpha, where alpha is the angular acceleration. Now, if there's a net torque on the system, then that means that the angular momentum will change with time. If the torque is constant, or if the time change is relatively small and we take small time steps, then we could write an expression relating the angular momentum to the torque in the following way. The final angular momentum of your system is equal to the initial angular momentum of your system, plus the net torque acting on that system times the time interval delta t. Okay? And this shows you, I think, you know, explicitly that the change in the angular momentum and the change are, and the torque are in the same direction, okay? And this expression is going to be especially useful if you need to code or program angular momentum and torque. Now, if the torque is zero on a system, then that means that dl dt, which is equal to the torque, is equal to zero. And this means that the angular momentum does not change with time, which means that the angular momentum is conserved. And so that means that we can add this to our laundry list of conservation laws that we have. So you can talk about conservation of energy, right? You can talk about conservation of momentum if there's no net external force on the system. And now you can talk about the conservation of angular momentum if there's no net torque acting on a system. I wanted to do an example problem for you using um, torques, and this is an Atwood's machine, okay? So here, um, what we're going to do is we're going to find the acceleration of these masses, A, okay? So what we have here is mass M1 and mass M2 connected by a rope that goes over a pulley. Now, if we assume that the rope doesn't slip on the pulley so that, you know, as the rope pulls, the pulley turns nice and smoothly, we are also going to assume that this is not a massless pulley anymore, so we're going to give this pulley some substance to it, and we're going to say that it has a mass, m sub p, and a radius r, okay? And so we're going to solve for the acceleration on this system. Now you can see here that um, the... 
you can see here that the mass 2 is obviously heavier than mass 1, and so that causes mass 2 to drop and mass 1 to lift up with the acceleration. And you can see, of course, too, that that's going to cause the pulley to rotate, okay? So what's happening here is that we've got uh, free body diagrams going on here. We've got a free body diagram for mass 1, and the forces acting on mass 1 are the tension in the rope upwards and the pull of gravity on mass 1 downwards. So that's T1 up and M1G down. Now, similarly on mass 2, we've got a tension from the rope, and that's going to be T2, and it's acting upwards. And we've got the pull of gravity down, so that's M2G acting downwards. Now, if we can't ignore the pulley anymore, if we can't ignore its mass, then what that means is that the tension on either side of the pulley is not necessarily going to be the same, right? So it's, it's a different tension on the left and the right. This is a different assumption that you would make if you called it a massless pulley, or a pulley that had a negligible mass compared to the size of the masses that were attached to it, okay? So we can't do that anymore, no more massless pulleys, right? So because the tension is different on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of that pulley on the rope, then that means that we're going to have a net torque on this pulley, okay? And so we have a torque that is trying to turn it um, counterclockwise from T1, and that's acting on the left-hand side of the pulley. The tension goes down. Remember, the tension of rope goes both ways, okay? And then on the right-hand side of a pulley, um, you have a, a torque that's trying to rotate it clockwise, and that's T2 acting um, downward on the right-hand side of the pulley, and that would tend to rotate the pulley clockwise. So by convention, we usually say that counterclockwise torques are positive and clockwise torques are um, negative. Okay, so that's our convention. And then, of course, we're going to go standard convention for the forces, which is that down is negative and up is positive. Now, this is um, kind of a 1D problem for the masses because they're just going up and down. And so I'm just looking at the Y components of the forces for the free body diagrams. So what we're going to do now is look at the three equations that we're going to get. We're going to get one equation from the sum of the forces on mass 1. We're going to get one equation from the sum of the forces on mass 2. And then we're going to get one equation from the sum of the torques on the pulley. So that gives us three equations, all right? And we have three unknowns here. If we assume that we can measure M1 and M2, we know G, then that leaves the unknowns are the tension in the rope on either side, T1 and T2, and then the um, acceleration. Now what we're really after is the acceleration, okay? So that's what we're going for. Okay, so let's look at these equations. For uh, mass 1, the sum of the forces is T1 minus M1G is equal to M1A. Okay, so the net acceleration in the sketch, at least, it shows the acceleration going up, okay? So the acceleration is up, so that's positive for mass 1. For mass 2, though, mass 2 goes down. So the sum of the forces on mass 2 are going to be T2 minus M2G, right, is equal to minus M2A. Because if we just take the magnitude of the acceleration as A, then I still have to show that it's going down, so I put a minus sign there. All right, um, so now, assuming that the um, counterclockwise torque, sorry, I fixed it in here, but I didn't fix it over here. Assuming that a counterclockwise torque is um, positive, then what we've got here is RT1 is our positive torque on that uh, left-hand side, right? Because remember, we've got our rotation axis here, that's the uh, the rotation axis, so that would be our origin for our torque. And it would point from here to the uh, point of application of the force. Now that's the radius of the pulley, which we said was R, okay? So R cross F would be uh, R cross the tension, and then the angle in between our position vector and uh, T1 is going to be 90 degrees. So that sine of 90 is 1, okay? So that's why we write the torque as RT1 for this um, T1 force. And then for the T2 force, the torque would be minus RT2, and that's because the torque, two, uh, from, the torque from tension 2 tends to rotate it clockwise, which is negative. Okay, so that's RT1 minus RT2 is equal to 
I times minus alpha. Now remember, if it's a clockwise rotation, that's a negative. Okay, that's negative. So that's why the minus sign is on the alpha. Now the angular acceleration for this pulley would be equal to <clears throat> alpha is A over R. Okay, so if the rope doesn't slip on the pulley, then the acceleration of the rope is what causes the angular acceleration of the pulley. And those are related to one another via the equation alpha is equal to A over R. Okay, so that's how that looks. Now, looking at the next bit, we're going to combine these three equations to solve for our acceleration. Okay, so let's rearrange it. Um, what we're really after is the acceleration, um, but what we have are these tensions, right? Um, and the tensions give us expressions uh, that contain uh, the masses, the acceleration, and the acceleration due to gravity. So if we can take those equations uh, for the force, rearrange them and solve for T1 and T2, and then we can plug those back into our torque equation, and we'll just have isolated the acceleration, which is what we're really after. So rearranging that force equation, we end up with T1 is equal to M1A plus M1G, and T2 is equal to minus M2A plus M2G. Okay? Now, Plugging that back into our equation for torque, we're going to plug in T1 and T2, the expressions that we just found, into our torque equation. We end up with R times M1A plus M1G minus R times minus M2A plus M2G. And then that's equal to um, I times minus A over R. Okay, now solving this equation... Um, and rearranging it and getting it a little nicer, what we're going to do is we're going to divide both sides by R to simplify a little bit. And so I end up with then M1A plus M1G plus M2A minus M2G is equal to I times minus A over R squared. All right, now uh, we're going to assume that our pulley is a disc, okay? And discs have a moment of inertia of one-half MR squared, right? So plugging in, uh, we end up with I is equal to 1 half times the mass of the pulley times the radius of the pulley squared. We're going to plug that in for I, and then we get the equation M1A plus M1G plus M2A minus M2G is equal to minus 1 half times the mass of the pulley times R squared times A divided by R squared. The R squareds cancel, and that leaves us with minus 1 half mass of the pulley times A on the right-hand side. Okay, so great. Now we have everything in terms of some masses, accelerations, and the acceleration due to gravity g. Let's take everything that has the acceleration onto one side of the equation and everything that doesn't have a on the other side of the equation. So that gives me, I'm going to take it to the left-hand side, m1a plus m2a plus one-half mass of the pulley times a is equal to, now the stuff that doesn't have a, m2g minus m1g. All right? We're almost there. On the left-hand side, all we have to do is factor out um, the acceleration and then divide by the factor from both sides. And when we do that, we end up with the acceleration is equal to g times m2 minus m1 divided by m2 plus m1 plus one half times the mass of the pulley. Okay, so that's it. All right, well, um, I hope that example helped out, helped you understand a little bit more about torques and how we apply them. And uh, I'll see you around. I'll see you in class.